I recommend all of you who are interested in primary education and what reforms work and when reforms will work, you should actually read what she's written. So with that, Anisha, it's all yours. Yeah, it is. And, uh, thank you, Pradeep. I don't know how the slides work. Do I ask for the next one to come in? Clicker. Okay. Okay. So, uh, without much ado, uh, then I worked in primary or school education. And just like Harsh there, you know, this work in the primary or school education sector was a straight out of college. And I decided not to go in for that usual stuff. And I worked with the World Bank then and the government when India drew the first uh, loans from the World Bank for primary education. And India and China took that loan in the early 90s. Uh, it was predicted, I mean, the Education Secretary of India was then said to have told off the World Bank Director at uh, Jomtien that India would not borrow. India did and China did, and that helped the bank as well. Uh, the two of them took it for different sectors, India for primary and China for its higher education sector. Uh, the two countries, in almost 25 years of my engagement with policy reforms, I saw the two different countries with different outcomes uh, with what they did uh, with their uh, uh, folios of loan. Uh, my understanding is that India did not do as well, uh, but it did different things. And to a certain extent, a lot of the debate that we have today, the Pratham, for example, or the fact that the debate has come around to quality, has been because of the fact that a lot did happen then. It happened in slow, protracted ways through many negotiations, through many political contracts that were written at various levels. To my surprise, uh, when I was doing my doctoral work at the LSE, I realized uh, that the CPM, uh, which would always say imperialism down, down, and don't want to work with the World Bank, one of the reasons why the education reforms were working in certain districts in Andhra Pradesh, not all of them, uh, in East Kodauri, for example, in Pratupadu Mandal, where I was working, I realized the common enmity uh, with the ultra-left groups, the PWG, which kept local surveillance, made both Naidu and CPM collaborate. The immediate collaborators for the reform programs to work were what is anticipated in economic theory that the unions would oppose. The unanticipated was happening and the reforms were taking off the ground. And that's my take really. In a sense, I've left that part of me bundled up somewhat in a book now. It's an OUP publication. Uh, another part of me now traverses the ground to try and understand higher education as it exists on the ground. Uh, I'm going to look at that and come back then uh, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to have uh, some part of a con canvas, and this time I'll try unfurling India as I see it now, as I walk around the ground, through campuses, higher education campuses around India, some of it, and, and that's really setting up the uh, federal field. Then I'm going to talk about what did we anticipate. I mean, there were high expectations when the Modi government came in. What some of those, and uh, uh, the high expectations were of both kinds. Some people feared this would happen, the others felt the government would do this. So both of them were part of that basket. Uh, the third, of course, is viewing change. Three and four are roughly the same. I come back to the canvas again and see how, indeed, the script can be written. And the manner in which I do it, I borrow a lot from Wildowski himself, as you know. The, the hopes that you build in Washington, how it's unfurling in Oakland. So as I stand here, I learn from you, from intellectual engagement with you. And as I end, I end with an ode to the idea of institutionalization of the public university in your California model. And I do think that coming back a full circle, we have some plank, some importance uh, of engaging with you in idea terms and rebuilding our institutions in a sense in which all these issues of poverty, inequality can be addressed as much by the academy as we expect that one leader acting with the PMO to act. My question is, is the academy in India able to engage with all these questions? And that requires renegotiated grounds. So when I'm doing this, I'm looking at the sector per se, and I'm going around. Uh, now, this is all, we could actually skip this, uh, but one of the points that's important here is, uh, the dilemma is that education is really a state level activity. It was also in the federal division of responsibilities, a completely strictly uh, state-level activity till it was brought on to a concurrent agenda in 1976 
a lot of you would say that that was the emergency moment. A lot of things that were done were really eating up the territory of the state. But that's also allowed the center to emerge as a strategic actor and to signal changes. Some of those signals are uh, really the early investments in the higher and tech education sector. Uh, then somewhat putting in the plan allocation money into primary education, especially after 1995, the offtake of the midday meal scheme, for example, is also one of those central signals that's uh, drastically changed the landscape of what we see as a schooling sector as a pan-India entity today in India. So those, those are the important bits here. Now, the center is also a very important actor in the higher education sector. It ought not to be, but it is, because of the fact that the regulatory regimes uh, today and those are very bundled uh, regimes uh, I try and read up all the cases and all the stuff that goes in there and I find that often I've scribbled by the side of what I read it looks like a Calcutta tram wire to me so the unbundling of that was certainly one of the expectations and that expectation has gone on for a while now it's been a claim on the Dirigiste state that they can not just lower command and control but also unbundle uh, some of this and that's a task that's not as simple as it seems. Now the disturbed uh, political canvas of higher education has been such that education could as much be a law and order. Now education is a state subject and law and order is a state subject and both of these create complications of one kind or the other. So let's look at some of this disturbed campus uh, situation that uh, you know the immediate news that you've been hearing about and I can tell you there are lots of pictures of JNU on my mobile but that's with Harsh. We have no JNU pictures here. Now, I'm going to take you, this is the Patna University uh, campus, that's the Minto Chhatravas, and you can clearly see the Lingdo Committee recommendations are all on the wall up there. And a lot of you spoke about philanthropy, a lot of the unbundling of the system is also about, all these are endowments from the Darbhanga Maharaj, and the Darbhanga Maharaj was in battle with Nehru himself. Some of the first early amendments that come up is Kameshwar Singh State of Darbhanga versus the Union of India, but that man, who was an anti-Nehruvian. So in a sense, that state is building itself this anti-Congress ideology, which Darbhanga Maharaj fighting Nehru on some grounds, but actually on the other side, donating a lot of his property to make what is called Patna University today. But that's the Chhatravas, and it's really today home to unauthorized occupants. Now, what? this is the other Chhatravas. Okay, now. Sir, help me. Oh. Okay. This is called the Ambedkar Chhatravas, which has been built out of a scheme. So that was out of the old grants given by the Darbhanga Maharaj. This is from the new welfare scheme. Now this is the Ambedkar Hostel. Now that and a group of hostels in what is called the coaching district. And the coaching district has institutions that lo and behold are in the name of someone called Ram Manohar Roy. Now the coaching district actually fights with the Ambedkar Chhatravas and on February 7, 2013, the violence was such that crude bombs were exploded. And the Dalit students that I spoke to, they said, jaundice cases are very frequent because no water can be supplied to these hostels. There's no electricity ever. And the students of this hostel had asked for an electricity, electricity supply when the Saidpur block of four hostels actually attacked them. And the language used by them is for you verbatim. And those of you who are ethnographers will understand the pain of the language when the Bhumihars who live in the Minto Chhatravas and claimed loyalty to the Ranveer Sena, Mukhiya, Brahmeswar, and they said, And which literally means that why do you want electricity in Patna? Has your generation of... Uh, uh, you know, those who precede you, have they ever seen electricity ever? And that becomes the point at which they are given what they are. Now, then what does the state do? The state does reforms. It's a typical fixed model. It imports a vice chancellor from the south. Somebody from the south is going to be a neutral man. And this vice chancellor is somebody called V.C. Simhadri. He has a one-line man, one, uh, line brief from the government, fix the system. And by the time Simadri does one round, then he does another round, he comes back in the second round and he says, look, if the state does not give me enough support, I can recommend to the state that they shut this university down. And look at how this opens up here, exactly the opposite of what we're hearing from JNU. The vice chancellor says, 
the administration does not support us it does not send the police and when i interview the police officer the patna city sp sudhakar lande tells me students are not criminals and it is the job of the university to mend them so that's the grounded uh, visual of the autonomy argument i think i can you put it on again now uh, so the broader canvas is what i take you on to now forget about the patna story that's the one that i always come back to aligarh muslim university august 2014 now this firing was done using local tamanchas and this was one of the first invites i got after i came back from the lsc and this was my first ever visit to the amu and what a brilliant land grant this is so while i was looking at the buildings i hear this story and then i go on and do the interviews and the ethnographies and i was told students from gazipur and bihar come here and they have access to local weapons and they often carry their local fights and the local weapons with them and this is why it's happened labar 2012 hostel elections but kerala is the most interesting story because that's the one that i've been tracking until the end now uh, in 2015 the kerala students union and the important leaders omen chandi vaila ravi founded the kerala students union omen chandi uh, vaila ravi name it uh, ak antony even sudhiran who is right now the head of the uh, kerala congress uh, right now they've all been kerala student uh, students union leaders uh, so the ksu and the sfi clash and the issue is that the maharaja college autonomy scheme the sfi feels that autonomy is a route to privatization and the ksu then goes on to say that we were the ones who overthrew the oppressive regime of the communists and we brought them down i said what was the issue because nambudri pad raised the fares for transportation for students so we brought down that oppressive regime we can bring down any oppressive regime so they remember still the memories of 1958 west bengal presidency now the latest in the kerala uh, thing is what immediately connects with the story that i will not talk about and that's jnu now here the head of the higher education council tp shrinivasan a former ifs officer uh, this is this january walking up to a uh, international conference conference on internationalization of higher education that's the way he and his government think they should go but the sfi actually goes and slaps him while he is walking into the conference venue that idea could indeed have been debated there are uh, uh, global cases of saying that opening international uh, type uh, uh, educational enclaves in export processing zones some examples that we have from south korea haven't worked well but that was an issue for debate not of slapping mr shrinivasan now with what was the anticipated from the modi government almost everybody thought the policy policy paralysis would be over a lot of people would say that he spoken out against corruption and and the word that he had used in his election speeches neta mein niti aur niyat dono honi chahiye in the education sector a lot of people felt that at least the politics of uh, vc appointments uh, would be something that could go a lot of people also feared that the ncrt text would be saffronized again and there was a lot of focus therefore on a building that that exists next to where i work the ncrt and a lot of friends would come saying letters have already started coming from the gujarat government saying we portrayed them wrongly in the history textbooks so all this was fear on the sideline and the last one that i talk about is his speech in lohar dagga 27th march 2014 it's a part of the electoral ethnography that i was doing and i was actually listening to his speeches on the ground now there in gumla he appealed to the youth that had gone on to the maoist uh, 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 ideology and its fold and he said rasta kalam ka nahi hai hal ka hai bandook chhodiye and he appealed to them ki padhai likhai karke aap rozgar mein aaiye and that indeed is the way forward so in a sense he was drawing the youth out and the anticipated was that this would be the lines along which the modi government would unfold so this does somewhat give you a template against which you can uh, see some of the actions now i i get into this new job the first thing i probably join on the 19th of june by the 20th i'm on a committee which says ugc committee roll back fyup now i was a part of the delhi university for very long i knew a lot of what had been happening i was very unhappy with what had happened uh, but sitting on the committee uh, was not a very happy moment this was a ugc committee uh, the ugc chair is someone who who is also it is it is said or alleged is a political appointee of the uh, upa government especially the upa2 regime but that committee was actually never led by the ugc chair himself 
the ministry never directed us, but one amongst us did have very clear instructions to roll back the FYUP. And the discussions and debates, therefore, that we had, uh, even if, for example, I felt that a lot of wrong had been done, I did feel that some of the elements of the FYUP were worth the university considering and adopting. Uh, why must a university not think about changing on time uh, if it's an annual mode? Why can it not have something else? None of those issues were really discussed or debated. The one line instruction was this has to be rolled back. So a couple of meetings we debated the issues, but by the third meeting, literally the thing was cut out and written up for us. So this is how you've got to do it. So okay, I said, okay, fine. This is the circumscribed limit within which we have to work and act. Uh, but one of the things that I found was that there was the students union leader, Aman Awana, on it. This was my first time that I was meeting a student union leader uh, from the university. And I thought this might be a new way of engagement. Now that's something that I find changes. The second thing that I was a part of was the national mission for teachers. Another high moment when everybody felt that things would be done uh, for teachers. Uh, but my disappointment even here was that like most of the policies, this was done really last minute. And nothing new there, no deliberation, no thinking, just given a clean order saying, you've got to do it in a week's time, really. And by the time you even thought about something new or innovative or changing some parts of it, especially the scholarship part really needs to be thought out carefully. There was no time to do it. You really had to stick it because the prime minister had to announce this policy on a certain date. So there was nothing new, but it did at least happen. Now, that's the other part that we've been uh, talking about. L lots of consultations have gone on at various levels, but nobody really knows how the policy itself is being formulated. Uh, we could come back to it during the discussion time. Uh, I think the most promising moment in, in all of what I've seen has been the budget. It's a trim speech. It really talks about very few things, but talks about relevant things. It, it does talk about putting money on improving quality in school education, and it does talk about having a cleaner regulatory regime uh, so that at least the public and private can coexist. But what it does talk about is world-class universities. And what my plea to you here is that help us in understanding how we can have a thriving ecosystem of a public university and not just world-class. And I know and I'm uh, you know, in touch with a lot of your scholars who work on uh, relevant and flagship models, not just the world-class worldwide. Because at this point of time, we are really so bad that we could try very hard even in two Modi governments, we would at best be very average. So let us try and aspire to be good average universities, but at least have a thriving ecosystem of them. Uh, so the other no uh, disturbing trend that I could see early enough was that the, under the phase one of policy reforms, it was says most policy reforms in India have got done by an approach that a lot of it is uh, done under the radar. Uh, I could see now that it was approach had been replaced completely and direct politics of the stick was something that had been used early on, not just in the JNU days. But the direct engagement with youth on campuses, even in coaching districts, and youth were now seen as a politicized segment. Now, Aman Awana was treated favorably, uh, but in another uh, attack, uh, you know, state uh, orders on, on selective targeting of civil service aspirants. Now, the aspirants uh, from the aspirants from Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, they lived in a different part of Delhi. They lived in the Karolbagh area, and the reports were that they were spared, but those who were from a particular state that was going to the polls, in Mukherjee Nagar, there was, there was lati charge on the students. Now, coming back uh, to the canvas again, so what's been given by Mr. Modi in terms of quality education is really a very, uh, it's just probably a preface of a statement. Now, this type of statement could have come in year one of the uh, government itself. Uh, my real understanding is that when we say that the poor are sending their children uh, to private schools, it is in a way affirming to us that there is a ground swell of demand from the poor of India, most of them first generation learners, for high quality education. And that struggle to get high quality education is not simply one of demanding it, but people actually are killed in their road to demanding good quality education. Gandaman, and this piece is on the LSE website, it's a blog that I've done. It was a village of all backward castes and attacked by the RJD then simply because the backward caste children were going to school. 
and there are uh, the people who attacked them were PDS dealers supplying the ration for midday meal and transporting it, all of it in collusion. Now, this is uh, a notebook from one of the children who passed away in this tragedy. 23 children died in Gandaman eating this, the state mandated uh, school meal. Now, this is one of the copies if you see. In their last hours, just before they've gone for this meal, they've done tricks with mathematics, adding up digits on the first one. This one's a more simple column. That's 12, 24, 36, 48. So there were things happening. And the school was a school that had children uh, going from grade one to three. So this was a school that was going on. This wasn't an abandoned site. And it was children who were wanting quality education. This is the sister. That's the sister of one of the children who's passed away. And when I meet them in their family grounds, even when it's a school that's brought death to an entire hamlet that's lost 23 children, it's like the Pied Piper effect. If you go to school, we will absolutely you know, kill all the children who ever went to school. These are one of the few who escaped this. And what does she want to do? She's still sitting with that book there. Now, uh, it's, it's an invocation to thinking about what we want to do. Uh, some of the things that we need to do, and these are not big order things. The GDP growth rate needs to be maintained. It should go high, inshallah. But some of the things that we need to do really don't entail much of the bounty coming uh, from the economy. It's really first principles about the census being the heart of a university system, a thriving university system, a lesson that we draw from you. And uh, the university at an arm's length from the state. In a sense, whether it's the Maharaja College or it's the AMU, I mean, it, it pains me to see that, who, you know, today's Amiruddin Shah is meeting the Prime Minister of India, uh, but he's talking about the, you know, uh, the, the status of the university. I'm always reminded of the fact that Zamiruddin Shah is a former Lieutenant General of the Army. Would academics be applying for top positions in the Army? And he has to talk about this today. So in a sense, depoliticizing the university in a very significant and major way. We won't be able to move ahead unless we are able to do that to the university as a site. You've got to reconstitute it as a public site and not let it remain as the administrative or law and order site that it currently is. Uh, so what we need at the end, I would say, is relevant flagships uh, that would serve our diversity well in place of an exclusive emphasis. I'm not saying we shouldn't have, but the exclusive emphasis only on world class and that all these that exist on the ground are all pests and law and order type uh, locations, that image needs to go. And that, that I think is a far harder task than simply uh, saying that these are politicized or these are law and order uh, places. So it's really a type one error that you need to understand about universities, but understand these as, as a Democrat, understand it with the spirit of diversity and reconstitute dissensus and discussion as a heart of a thriving university ecosystem.